does not have an eye so Thank you for that introduction. I always feel like it's hearing your own obituary when I have a list like that. But, uh, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. The talk I'm going to give isn't, uh, how could I put it, a finished piece of work. It's an idea that we've been working on. And it might turn out to be completely uh, fruitless. And then again, it might not. Uh, maybe you can be the judges of that. Uh, what I intend to do in the talk is I'm going to try to uh, bring together uh, three kind of different uh, areas. One is uh, some thinking about uh, whoops, uh, autobiographical memory, called self-memory system. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the default core network, which Dan Schachter has already spoken about, so I'll just touch on that briefly. And then I want to talk about some uh, thinking about narrative thinking and then apply that to one or two patients we've been looking at, patients with uh, brain damage. Uh, and also more widely, as you'll see. So uh, the first part of the talk is really quite theoretical, and then we'll move on to some uh, patient data. So we uh, originally uh, proposed the self-memory system uh, uh, quite a few years ago now uh, to account for what we saw as a constructive nature of human memory. And that nature uh, had become apparent from uh, experimentally-based studies, uh, neuropsychology, uh, largely case studies uh, of various types of amnesia, uh, and then the emerging neuroimaging of the 1990s, uh, particularly uh, from uh, Morris Moscovich's lab, actually. Uh, and uh, the nature of autobiographical memory and psychological illnesses, all of these different uh, domains of uh, sources of data converged on the view that autobiographical memory is constructive. And we'll see some evidence relating to that shortly. Um, Oops. Uh, so it's, it's important, I think, uh, uh, to note that uh, in the self-memory system, memories are not considered to be, memories are considered to be constructed, not reconstructed. So lots of different types of knowledge enter into remembering. So when you remember uh, when we met in Sofia, you probably don't remember what clothes I was wearing, but I assure you I was wearing some. And in your memory, I probably am. But your brain automatically kind of puts that information in. Uh, so memories consist of different types of personal knowledge, uh, conceptual and episodic, uh, interlocked in a moment uh, of remembering. Now, although personal and conceptual knowledge are part of uh, long-term memory, a specific autobiographical memory has only a transitory existence. So when it's not in mind, when it's not in consciousness, when it hasn't been constructed, it doesn't somehow exist back there somewhere in the brain. The bits of knowledge that are made from are distributed in different networks. And it's not till those networks interlock in an act of remembering that you actually have a memory in mind. Uh, so let's briefly uh, consider uh, the nature of this knowledge. And I just want to put this diagram up briefly just to get across the idea that there is lots of conceptual knowledge at the highest level. People think there's a structure called the life story, which has been investigated by quite a few people, particularly Tillman Habersmas in Germany. Uh, interestingly, the life story uh, has a developmental aspect to it. So if you ask somebody for their life story in an experimental setting, then they'll, they'll provide one for you, or perhaps they'll provide several. Uh, if you ask a 10-year-old, what's your life story? they'll just look at you like you're a bit strange. <laughs> so there's something that happens uh, over this period of development in adolescence into early adulthood that allows a life story to come into being. And interestingly, that's paralleled by what we now know are uh, late developments, uh, developments in the brain, brain changes that take place in adolescence, uh, probably to do with the frontal lobes working more efficiently and uh, developing something like a life story. And then there's other types of information to do with periods from your life, to do with uh, general events occurring in those periods. And then they uh, contain information that allows you to access different levels of these knowledge structures. They're not directly connected. These uh, lines are meant to indicate the action of cues that access different uh, sets of knowledge in the knowledge structure. And then down here, these greystone-like objects are episodic memories. So there are specific fragments of uh, experience which have been retained. Uh, I don't think an episodic memory ever retains literally experience. 
And it's an interesting question about what is actually retained in a specific episodic memory. I don't think it can be uh, some record of your experience. It could be something that's derived from that. It could be something that represents it, but it can't literally be from your experience. And I think that's true even in extreme cases such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Anyway, the whole idea is these different uh, types of knowledge, uh, and it's patterns of activation that arise and dissipate in these knowledge structures, and those patterns of activation are created by cues that lead to the generation or construction uh, of specific memories. So executive processes operate on those knowledge structures, but they can't directly influence them. All they can do is influence the nature of the cues which are used to probe the knowledge base. And they do that by elaborating those cues. Uh, Actually, I'm just going to skip over that because we don't need to know about it. Uh, so uh, this type of complexity uh, has be, really been very well reflected, I think, uh, in brain imaging studies. Uh, and uh, these have tended to show that when people bring to mind a specific memory, it's actually a really rather complicated thing neurologically. So you get activation in the frontal lobes, you get activation in uh, the temporal lobes and the posterior areas as well, particularly occipital areas. Uh, and uh, here's a little graphic kind of illustrating that. This is a, a review of neuroimaging studies uh, up to about 2007 by uh, Roberta Cabeza and Peggy St. Jacks. And you can see, uh, I'm not going to go through it all now, but this entire network becomes active when people are recalling specific memories. Uh, more recently, has been uh, the discovery is what's been termed the default uh, core network. And this is a, co a complicated uh, distributed network that stretches throughout the neocortex, the limbic system, uh, and the frontal lobes. Uh, and it's active when attention is not task-focused. And in fact, it emerged from originally looking at uh, brain activations in what was called the resting state. So in initial neuroimaging studies in the uh, late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, the control condition was usually lie in the scanner and don't do anything. Right? But of course the brain can't just switch itself off, it does something. Uh, and what it does is it activates the uh, default network. Uh, and I've uh, stolen without permission some uh, figures here from some of Dan's work. Uh, and this kind of depicts uh, the default network uh, in a meta-analysis over several different uh, studies. Now, what's interesting about uh, that is it's highly similar to the autobiographical memory uh, network. Uh, and here's a not very good uh, piece of thieving, but uh, that's the autobiographical memory network. Uh, this is people envisaging the future while they're in the scanner, uh, and this is people doing a theory of mind task. And all of these tasks seem to involve the core network in one way or another. Uh, I don't think that should surprise us. Uh, and the reason why is, what do we do when we're not supposed to be doing anything? When you're lying in a scanner and someone said to you, do nothing, well, you lie there in daydream. Right? Uh, and uh, daydreaming involves thinking about the future, thinking about memories, thinking about how the past might have been, thinking about plans, etc. The person who did, I think, the best work on this, the fullest work, is a person called Jerome Singer, who did uh, work in the 60s and 70s, and 80s on daydreaming. And actually, it's worth going back and looking at his work. I think his work's pretty impressive. Uh, daydreaming doesn't really, well, the term doesn't really capture the fact that a lot of this mind wandering is not random. It's not, how could I put it? It's not, it's not, it's not as though it's not driven. Even though you're not intentionally really doing anything, it does have a logic to it a lot of the time. And so we started thinking about this in terms of uh, what we call narrative thinking. And uh, narrative thinking, in the way I'm going to report it to you, uh, or describe it to you, comes from a man called Peter Goldie, who's a philosopher, who tragically died, actually. This was his last book, uh, which he published in uh, 2012. It's called The Mess Inside. And uh, I recommend reading it. It's a great book, even though it's by a philosopher. Uh, Basically, what he does is he brings together ideas from literature and from philosophy of literature uh, together with ideas about memory and develops this concept of uh, narrative thinking. And uh, we want to emphasize within this concept the capacity for imagining and for fiction. 
Uh, narrative thinking has three main characteristics. First of all, it's coherent, it's meaningful, and it's evaluative and has some emotional qualities to it. And I'll just go through those uh, briefly. So, according to Goldie's view, or his view of uh, narrative uh, thinking, uh, coherence refers to the fact that uh, these narratives have a shape to them. They're not just a list of things. So your daydreams have a shape to them. It's not just a list of items that you're going through. And he draws on the notion of what another philosopher, a French philosopher, uh, called Ricoeur, referred to as emplotment. So these, these narratives, uh, in a sense, have a sort of plot to them, as do perhaps uh, daydreams. And an emplotment uh, extracts a configuration out of items. So a list wouldn't be a narrative, but a list where the items were related to each, each other in some way thematically would be. Uh, interestingly, in terms of meaning, uh, Goldie uh, proposes that narratives have two perspectives, an internal perspective, right? Uh, which reveals how the thoughts, feelings, and actions of the people internal to the narrative uh, could have made sense to them at the time. And it has an external perspective. A, narr a narrative can be meaningful by revealing the narrator's external perspective. Uh, and these two perspectives are interrelated. Right? So the internal meaningfulness of a narrative, its emotional and evaluative uh, import, emerges because the narrative is the product of the external narrator. So I suggest that this flickering backwards and forwards between internal and external perspectives is exactly what occurs when we daydream. When we're constructing memories, memories and narratively thinking about our lives. And indeed, there's a distinction that we should all be familiar with that we often make in memory research between field and uh, observer perspectives. An observer perspective being one in which you see yourself in a memory, so that would be an external narrative, and a field memory is one in which you apparently have something like your original perspective, and that would be an internal narrative. In fact, field and observer are, are uh, I think, concepts that need a lot more empirical exploration because they're not straightforward. Nonetheless, uh, when we're narratively thinking or daydreaming, uh, then we flick back and forth between these internal and external perspectives. So it's a bit like a distinction between uh, autobiography versus autobiographical memory, if you want, where autobiography would be an external sort of perspective on one's life uh, autobiographical memory would be an internal generating uh, specific, uh, specific memories. Right, so my uh, suggestion, uh, now we can get off all of this theory a bit and look at some patients, uh, is that when we're in uh, default mode, when the core network is running, uh, we're engaged in narrative thinking and creating coherent, meaningful and evaluative and emotional mental representations. And these will include conceptual uh, autobiographical knowledge, uh, especially of general events, so it seems. Uh, there will be some specific episodic memories that come to mind. Uh, and obviously there'll be memories of future events, uh, simulations of the future, as well as simulations of the past. And of course, all of this interlinked with plans and goals. Right. So, uh, and now we're getting more towards what I want to move on to, which is false memories. Uh, so while we're narratively thinking, we oscillate between internal and external perspectives. Right? Uh, and sometimes these narratives become memories or are experienced as memories. And that might be because they're represented uh, in the same brain region uh, where the networks that are used to generate memories also exist. Right? So the imaginings and the memories that occur in narrative thinking can sometimes become interlinked. Uh, and I would like to suggest that probably they always become interlinked, but we can come back to that. Oops. Uh, Goldie talks about, and this is the last bit I'm going to cover of his work, uh, what he calls fictionalizing tendencies. Right? And he argues that we have a tendency to structure our autobiographical narratives 
uh, in a way that's close to fictional narratives, but it might be the other way around. It might be fictional narratives are constructed to be close to the way our memories are. Nonetheless, the two are clearly uh, interrelated. Uh, and whatever the case, we all have our story or stories uh, about our lives. So Gurley identified four fictional tendencies, uh, which I think are quite interesting, actually. First of all, we plot our lives. Well, we've already spoken about that in terms of the life story. Uh, we find agency where there is none, so we have memories that try to make sense of things that have happened usually in the social world, uh, even though there's no sense to be made of them. Uh, and uh, there's a desire for a narrative thread, so there's a, a, an urge in narrative thinking to, for, to find closure or uh, some thematic cohesion to the narrative. And then one that I'm quite interested in, uh, fictionalizing tendency, is in terms of genre and character. Uh, that influence our interpretations, expectations, expectations uh, and memories. So in, in fiction, for example, it's not uh, usually open to the brave hero to also be a coward. And perhaps that's true in our narrative thoughts uh, and false beliefs about the self and others. And I'll come back to that a bit later on. Some psychological characteristics of uh, narratives are that they involve imagery, usually visual imagery, it doesn't have to be exclusively visual imagery, but most studies looking at autobiographical memory find that about 80% of them come to mind in the form of visual images. Uh, they involve feelings and emotions, and they also involve some very specific thoughts. Uh, and also, uh, there are probably multiple narratives that are running all at the same time, and which interrupt each other. So as you're sitting in the scan of daydreaming, or just sitting at home daydreaming or whatever, then different narratives cut through each other and come to mind. And it's probably uh, maladaptive if there's only one narrative running through your mind. In fact, psychological health might be related to how well you can coordinate a number of narratives uh, running at the same time. Uh, we believe, following uh, Singer's work, uh, that narrative thinking plays an important functional role in cognition. It's not just some kind of random firing of the system. Uh, and uh, we suggest that the purpose of narrative thinking is to maintain a dynamic self-system. And the main maintenance of a complex self-system takes place when attention is not task-focused. So it's when the default system is running. Now, maintaining a dynamic self-system uh, cognitively is probably quite expensive. Uh, and it's probably quite difficult to do. And it may be the case that you need to activate aspects of the self, consider them, imagine them, uh, counterfactually think about them in order to maintain a kind of dynamic, healthy self, and perhaps that's what happens in narrative thinking. We don't know yet, but uh, if the concept proves useful and we explore it further, we might find that's, in fact, the case. One implication uh, of this view is that if the capacity for narrative thinking is disrupted or impaired, perhaps by brain damage, then there will be changes in conscious thought when consciousness is not task-focused. And indeed, uh, a hint of this from a number of years ago comes from some patients studied by uh, Ledoux uh, back in the 1980s. These were anterior cingulate patients, and he uh, asked them about daydreaming, and they just said, I don't do it. When I'm not talking to you, my thoughts are completely blank. Which I always thought years ago when I first read it was an interesting kind of enigmatic sort of finding. I've always wondered about it, which is maybe why I started thinking about it narrative thinking. So uh, let's now see uh, how this theoretical thinking might help us in understanding aspects uh, of uh, memory following uh, brain damage, and particularly the emergence of confabulations and false memories. Uh, right. So recently we've begun looking uh, uh, at uh, narrative thinking, daydreaming, however you want to refer it, uh, in patient groups. Uh, I've always liked Morris's phrase, uh, confabulations are honest lies. And just before I came here, I had to mark 80 scripts from my course on memory dysfunction. And I mentioned honest lies, and every bloody script I started out with honest lies in it. <laughs> so it's a catchy phrase. Uh, they had to answer a question on confabulation, the students. Uh, just to give an example, he's a student of ours uh, who uh, we studied a number of years ago now, uh, Olive, she's dead. Uh, frontal damage following a road traffic accident. Right? Uh, as she recovered, she ge generated a whole range of confabulations, largely around her family. 
about how her husband had been a loving and devoted person, how her grandson had supported her and looked after her, and she'd stop people on the street and just tell them one of these stories. And it greatly disturbed her sisters, who didn't understand why she was lying. And in fact, they came to us and said, now she's recovered, she lies all the time, which fits your phrase, Morris. Uh, we came to the conclusion, having studied her uh, uh, fairly intensively, that the confabulations actually served a purpose. So they had a, a narrative sort of cohesion to them. The purpose was it made life much more bearable for her to imagine that she'd had this past, which in fact she hadn't had. Her son, uh, grandson wasn't a nice person at all and never visited her. Her husband had been a bit of an ogre. But uh, after her brain damage, she was able to generate this false history, this false narrative. Uh, another patient uh, we studied more recently, AO, uh, suffered right anterior, uh, uh, right anterior infarct uh, and began consisting an enduring paranoid confabulations uh, coupled with denial of her physical abilities. So she was paralyzed on the left hand side but she would claim she wouldn't, you know, say, well, can you stand up? And say, no, the nurse always puts me in this chair. I can't stand up. It's too, it's too low down, and et cetera, et cetera. It's what these patients typically uh, do. Uh, and her paranoid confabulations often centered on the nursing staff, uh, who she had memories of them taking money for her room. They used to wake her up in the night and move her room. These patients tend to have very disturbed sleep cycles. And so when they wake up during the night, they typically don't know where they are. Uh, and they assume they've been moved to another room. So go and see uh, AO in the morning, and she'd say, they moved my room three times last night. And of course, her, her room had never been moved. Uh, on the other hand, she also had some much more positive confabulations, and she had vivid memories of uh, the previous day going walking in her childhood village in Scotland. Of course, she couldn't walk, and she was in a, a nursing home in the north of England, not in Scotland. Uh, her confabulations to us seem to be attempts to make sense, a sort of narrative sense really, of a very difficult situation in which she was in. Right? Uh, her physical injuries were all attributed to the nursing staff, so they were kind of externalized from the narrative, if you want. Uh, all the cause of them was attributed externally. Uh, uh, and uh, the memories seem to sort of have an external perspective to them. The memories of walking in a village, on the other hand, uh, which actually may have been true, but just mislocated temporarily. So she must have walked in a village when she was a child. Maybe she now remembers that and believes she's just done it recently. So they, they could be true, but uh, they provided her with some comfort. They were positive for her. So uh, I want to call these, uh, I'm going to start calling them fictional memories rather than uh, confabulations. Uh, another patient of ours who we studied for a number of years, uh, patient CR, uh, she has a very large uh, right temporal lesion, uh, very severe memory impairment. She can form memories, but she loses access to them by the next day. So within a 24-hour period, she's lost. So if you say to her, tell me, Claire, what did you do this morning? She can tell you. If you ask her tomorrow, what did you do yesterday? She can remember nothing about yesterday. And in fact, her memories improved by using well, the camera that Dan showed, uh, Sensecam. Uh, she can regain access to some of these memories, which is formed, but she can't access them intentionally. She doesn't confabulate. She's a very good semantic processor and has a, a backward digit span that beat me, Alan Badley, and Catherine Loveday, who tested her. So she can do a backward digit span of 11. Uh, that's her lesion, just to give you a quick look at it. Uh, it's on the right side. Uh, it basically has taken out the whole of the right uh, temporal lobe. But it doesn't stretch to the uh, left hemisphere at all. Well, just recently, a while ago, once we got, in, when we got into thinking about narrative thinking, uh, it finally dawned on us that maybe we should ask her about what she does when she's not focused on a task. Uh, so it took us 10 years to come around to thinking of asking her this question. And she, uh, in a very agitated way, explained to us that when she wasn't doing something, it was like the world was just crashing through her mind. She couldn't switch it off. It was just running and running through her mind. Uh, and then we explored that a bit further with her. Uh, and it, what became apparent is what crashed through her mind were these lists 
that she made. So she'd been through some rehab for amnesia at the Oliver Zangwill Center in Cambridge, where they teach you how to make millions and millions of lists to help you remember when you can't uh, encode new memories. And she had lots of these lists, which she'd make with the help of her children and uh, her husband. And they were pinned on the fridge and on the table, and she carried around a diary with lists in. And it was these lists that kept going through her mind, sort of images of the lists. And so to, uh, to kind of stop this uh, terrible uh, cognition, she used to play the card game Solitaire, which she'd play for hours just to stop her being aware of this stuff going through her mind. Or she'd draw, uh, and she was very keen on drawing pictures of trees. I never really understood why, but she's got millions of pictures of trees that she's drawn. Right. Uh, so the experience for her is unpleasant. She has no control of the images. So it's as though she can still sort of have something that's a bit like normal default mode in the sense that these lists are usually about things she has to do. So if you were daydreaming, you might be daydreaming about things you have to do. So there's some similarity there. But it's clearly a really dysfunctional core system. Uh, and no doubt that's because of this huge uh, right hemisphere lesion. Uh, so mind wandering is not something that she can really do. Now a recent patient who uh, we haven't studied in person but uh, we're trying to persuade some colleagues in New Zealand to go and test him, uh, but we've found out this much from him so far. Uh, he, does, he has a known uh, brain damage in the uh, temporal uh, cortex, dorsolateral prefrontal as well, uh, also in the right hemisphere. And he complains of what he terms uncontrolled continuous recall of memory. So this is like uh, not being able to uh, sort of inhibit narrative thinking. So he says, uh, if I go for a walk, then I buy something at the shop while talking to the checkout operator, I'll get repeated images of what I saw when walking, entering my mind, which just ruins my proper concentration. Uh, when I do the dishes, for example, I will get constant recalling of images of doing the vacuum previously. If I dig a ditch, he's a gardener, uh, then the next day while mowing lawns, I'll get memories from uh, digging the ditch keep turning up. Uh, so these, these memories are highly intrusive and they're kind of running along all the time in his mind. And he says, uh, I have a, a few brief moments uh, of remission since his brain damage. Uh, and in these uh, three moments he's had, each about five minutes in length, <coughs> he suddenly discovered he could start planning his life. Uh, uh, but then, very rapidly, he'd slip back into this dysfunctional intrusion of recent uh, memories. So, uh, another patient with some uh, clear malfunction of narrative thinking, uh, which seems to depend upon uh, a breakdown in inhibitory control uh, of patterns of activation arising in the memory knowledge base. Uh, Another patient we've been looking at recently uh, is uh, patient MW, uh, who regularly confabulates on a, on a, on a daily uh, basis. A very skillful confabulation, so he's one of these confabulators where what he says is true in the sense that it comprises aspects of his life and aspects of his memory, but configured in ways which aren't true. Uh, so on one occasion, he recalls uh, hearing about the death of a close friend, and he told this to his wife, and his wife, uh, and he gave a detailed account of this friend, and et cetera, and his wife uh, then wrote a letter of condolence to the wife of the dead friend, who in fact wasn't dead. So, maybe, I don't know what sort of wishful thinking that was, but. Uh, his memories of the future, uh, we did a kind of keyword testing, so give me a keyword like garden, tell me something that might happen in the future, something plausible that might happen to you in your future. And of course, his confabulations are for the future are fantastic. So, uh, to the word garden, he says, uh, I own a garden on the moon uh, and all the other planets. Uh, and then he's going to uh, grow plants on all these planets in all these different interplanetary gardens. Uh, he says uh, he's going to uh, buy Mount Kilimanjaro, which is a mountain, and Mount Fuji. Uh, and he gets a prompt for a specific event. 
And then he says, if the English actor Sir Anthony Hopkins can own Snowdon, which is a famous mountain in Wales in England, and Sean Connery, former 007, can own Ben Nevis, another mountain in Wales, seems to be a hobby of these actors of buying mountains in Wales, uh, then uh, M.W. says, I can own Kilimanjaro. <coughs> so M.W.'s false past and future memories seem to involve sort of transitory emergence of personal meanings, only some of which have persisted over the time we've been uh, working with him. I think they're a continuous attempt to develop narrative meanings uh, about his past life and about his future. But obviously, you know, bearing this now, dysfunctional, dysfunctional executive processes. I mean, unlike uh, Antrigoid, amnesic person, you can, you can at least imagine the future. Okay? The imaginings are crazy, but you can kind of do it. All right, we recently tested uh, some uh, Alzheimer's uh, patients uh, in the uh, early stages of the disease. Uh, uh, and we used uh, a thing called the Warwick Edinburgh Wellbeing Scales, and that's because they uh, include questions on daydreaming. But it was fairly pointless because none of the patients uh, could answer these questions at all. They just claimed they never daydreamed. It just didn't happen. They knew what daydreaming meant. That wasn't the problem. It just didn't happen for them. And we had a small control group. We've only really got this study under, under, underway at the moment. Uh, of some older adults, uh, and they were all able to report daydreaming, and uh, on the questionnaire they said they daydreamed about 25% of their uh, waking time. So uh, it looks as though daydreaming isn't necessarily, or the capacity for narrative thinking isn't negatively affected by age alone. You've got to have some pathological aging for it to be uh, disrupted. These are just the first steps uh, in looking at uh, conscious thought in patient groups. Uh, we suspect that disruptions to conscious thought in mind wandering, the ability to think narratively, uh, might be more common than we are currently aware. Actually, you rarely go to the doctor and say, I can't daydream. Right, so it may be the case you can't daydream, but you just don't report it. Uh, so there could be a large under-reporting uh, of, of these sorts of changes in cognition following brain damage. Another area of fictional memories uh, where we don't have to go to brain damage, we can go to anyone in this room, is a memory for childhood. Uh, and there's been some uh, really quite interesting work by uh, Mazzoni and Scorbier and uh, their colleagues. Uh, they went around and asked people, do you have any memories you're suspicious about, about them being true? And it turns out that uh, about 20% of people do. Actually, I think it's more than that in recent studies. Uh, and some of these memories are often clearly false. My favorite is of a man who remembered being in the park with his mother as a child, watching dinosaurs walking over the hill in the distance. Uh, he knew it was false, but he still experiences it as a memory. It's interesting. Uh, sometimes these are associated with negative rather than positive events. Uh, we've often in our lab, when people recall childhood memories, and people when they recall them, they often say they see themselves in the memory, uh, then we ask them what they look like. Right? Uh, and the answers are really interesting. So they're nearly always, uh, not always, but very often drawn from a, fo a photograph. There's a photograph of me when I was two. When I get this childhood memory, that's how I look. Right? Uh, or sometimes they seem to derive from, you know, kind of family stories, family myths that allow them to construct an image of how they might have looked in childhood. Which is why earlier on I said these sorts of memories uh, are interesting memories that need to be looked at a bit more. They're not straightforward. Uh, here's a, an example of a false memory from childhood that I've always liked. I'll read it out to you. Uh, a middle-aged man recalled his father distracting him when he was a young boy about four years old, by asking him who was the first man on the moon. He'd been intensely interested in the moon landing when he was a young boy, and this incident occurred while uh, his father was on the phone to his mother, who'd just given birth to his younger brother. In those days, fathers weren't allowed to go in hospitals when their wives were giving birth, in England anyway. Uh, and he had a vivid and fond memory of his father placating him in this uh, way, and he was highly agitated by the birth, and in his memory he could see his father on the phone and almost hear his voice. Right. And it was only many decades later that he realized that his brother had been born in 1968, one year before the moon landing. So this memory had to be false. Or at least 
if not false, misdated. But I think it probably had to be false. But the interesting thing about it is, going back to the fictionalizing tendency of character, is that it portrays the father as a caring father. And maybe that was quite important in this person's autobiography. Uh, so these, these childhood memories perhaps give you know, kind of a sort of general perspective on one's childhood, usually of being a, a good time. But as uh, Adrian said, I've got five kids, and I can tell you basically they cry every three minutes until they're aged 18. And then, and then worse things happen. Uh, so these childhood memories often seem subject to the fictionalizing tendency of genre and character. So the good parent is always good, or at least remembered that way. Uh, and uh, the converse of that is that the bad parent is always remembered as bad. Right. And uh, that's most evident uh, in... Uh, cases of childhood uh, sexual abuse. I've been a memory expert witness for many years in England and uh, studied and uh, been consulted on many of these cases. Uh, a typical uh, complainant, that's the person who's saying they were abused as a child, uh, would have had an adverse childhood, right? uh, which often involved neglect, uh, emotional and physical abuse, uh, domestic violence, uh, and uh, they'd been uh, taken into care by social services, just characteristic of these sorts of uh, cases. Uh, and their subsequent uh, uh, adult life is marked by failed relationships, negative emotional experiences, uh, and uh, substance abuse is just endemic in this group. The memories of these uh, uh, patients, uh, patients, these, these people, uh, are interesting because they often date to very early parts of childhood and they're often very specific and highly detailed. And this is becoming a big thing in England now, you know, because it had a lot of celebrities have been accused of abusing people when uh, the people were younger. Uh, but now the wheels turning the other way, and, uh, the, uh, the politicians and the press are starting to question whether these memories are real, which is uh, it's an interesting uh, development. Uh, I won't go, they just remember lots of details, right? We've got a huge database of childhood memories and we never see uh, highly detailed memories uh, like the ones we see in cases of sexual abuse. So I've come around to the view that these memories uh, for the rememberer, the complainant, are, are probably true memories. They believe them, they experience them as memories. But in reality, they're not uh, uh, memories of specific events in many instances. Instead, what they do is they provide the uh, database for a narrative of uh, a life that's been, a life that's failed because of an adverse childhood. Uh, so, I, there's many ways they could arise, imagination, inflation, and lots of other ways. People dwell upon, think about, daydream about these bad times they had with a, a difficult parent or set of parents or a caretaker when they were a child. And in the course of that, they generate images, and these become eventually memories from the past. Right. Which they actually remember. Uh, so, as I said, uh, this fictionalizing tendency of genre may be uh, a device that lets us understand some of this. If you had an extremely adverse childhood, uh, then the people who are involved in it are all viewed as adverse, and your life continues being adverse. Right, well, that's quite a heavy topic, memory for sexual abuse. I'm not going to go further into it, but I think there are some interesting thoughts one might have or investigations that could be done there about how people think about that sort of past. Instead, I thought I might close on something more light-hearted, and that's the memory of politicians, right, who have many fictional memories. Right. But I think we should bear in mind that we're all politicians, but I'll just mention a few of them. I particularly like their fictional memories. What's interesting about them is they relate them, and they must know the instant they relate one that there are 20 journalists running out of the room to check whether it's true or not. So they know they're going to be found out. So I've kind of rather come around to the view that probably they really believe them, even though many of them are factually contradicted. Uh, 
so these uh, fictional memories are prominent uh, in politicians. The famous one is Ronald Reagan, uh, the American president. Uh, a very emotional memory of presenting a medal to a World War II soldier. And he gave a long account of this and how he'd done it and everything and how emotional it had been. And in fact, it's exactly word for word from the script of a movie called A Wing and a Prayer. Uh, so probably uh, Reagan had imagined it perhaps and it gradually by imagine inflation become imagination inflation become part of his uh, narrative about himself. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, current presidential candidate, has a wonderful memory of a trip to Bosnia where they landed kind of under fire uh, in a helicopter and they all had flat jackets on, they got out and they had to kind of crawl along and get in this military vehicle and be zoomed off to somewhere safe to have a meeting. And unfortunately, there is video footage of uh, this landing where they were met by officials in big black Bentley cars and escorted stately off the airport to a fine lunch somewhere else. And, and to her credit, uh, when she was confronted with this, she just said, yeah, I got it wrong, I'm a human. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is the only time she's knowingly said that. But, uh, uh, another great one you can see in the Michael Moore movie of the 9-11 uh, is uh, Bush's mistaken a recollection of seeing the first plane hit the tower in the 9-11 attack. Uh, at the time, Bush was actually visiting a, a primary school in the States, and he sat for an hour meditating on the news, so he didn't, he didn't see it initially. Uh, one of my favorites is the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, who claimed to have a memory of seeing a very famous footballer from the earlier half of the 20th century called Jackie Milburn. Uh, Jackie Milburn played for Newcastle United, a football team in the north of England, and that's where Blair's uh, constituency was. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, had he seen uh, Jackie Milburn playing, then he couldn't have been more than six months old. So, obviously, he'd imagined that, but it fits with the narrative of him being an MP for that particular part of the country. Uh, another great one is Mitt Romney, uh, one of the uh, presidential running mates uh, a while ago, recollecting attending the uh, Golden Jubilee, marking the 50th anniversary of the automobile industry. Uh, unfortunately, that took place nine months before he was born. Uh, and another great one from Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, which I quite like, uh, remembering being inspired to enter politics after watching the uh, Nixon-Humphrey presidential TV debate, uh, which unfortunately was never televised. <laughs> uh, and there are many more. I'm, I'm collecting them. If you've got any yourself, email them to me. I'll add them to the, to the list. Right. The, these false memories of politicians, these fictional memories of politicians, invariably link them into their communities uh, in one way or another. Make them seem to be, you know, uh, prestigious figures in their community, uh, linked into the history and able to obviously care for the community should they be elected. Uh, and as I said earlier, the interesting thing is that many of them seem to fully believe in these fictional narratives uh, and are often um, uh, completely uh, surprised when the journalists confront them and say, well, you can't possibly have remembered that because it happened before you were born. Uh, and the other thing is, as I said earlier as well, they must know they're going to be found out, but they still relate these memories. Okay, let's get to uh, some conclusions. As I said at the outset, this is just uh, some early thoughts we're having about fictional memories, about how uh, the core network and daydreaming uh, might lead to narratives which allow you to have these sorts of uh, representations. Uh, false or fictional autobiographical memories often support what we might call a self-narrative which is a part of the self-memory system. And if the function of daydreaming, or one of the functions of it, <coughs> is to kind of maintain uh, the dynamism of the self system, uh, then perhaps that's why uh, they're generated. Uh, they're certainly generated in the same brain networks as autobiographical memories, and in this respect are not unlike true autobiographical memories. The confabulating patient I mentioned earlier M.W., his confabulations about the past always contained information that was, was true. Right? It was just configured in ways that were false. And in fact, Alan Badley studied a whole series of frontal lobe confabulators, a similar sort of presentation. Uh, so, in a sense, you can have a true false memory, in that the content's true, 
but it's false because it's just not configured in the right way. Uh, and I uh, suspect that we all have lots of memories like that. What they do is, their function perhaps, is they allow us to have cells that are consistent and meaningful. Right? So when Tony Blair remembers watching Jackie Milburn, Jackie Milburn playing football, right, that defines a kind of sense who's interested in the working man, interested in those sorts of activities. Uh, they allow us to have a coherent uh, relationship with the past and also with the future, even if some or all of the narrative is fictional. And that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>